Hey everybody, it's Patrick and Travis and a little bit of talk and draw. And we have a special guest today, a special treat. We have Ben Rizbeck with us, right? Hello, hello. Say hi, Ben. <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> All Thanks the way from the, the far away East Coast. Absolutely, yeah. Joining us for a little uh, talk and draw. And this is a brand new thing where Travis and I like to come out and play and uh, talk shop, talk art and draw at the same time. And we couldn't think of anybody better to uh, come inside and play with us than Ben. Um, good friend wow. of ours who we've known for years at conventions and other places. Um, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Ben, professional illustrator, amazing cook, awesome dad, been working in entertainment and the commercial world for many years. Um, I got to say, to start off though, there's one thing that you do that I just love, and it's your lunch bag drawings. Um, you did that. I don't know if you still do it, but for a long time, every day you were posting these drawings that you would do on your daughter's lunch bags and just amazed at those little works of art. And I'm just wondering, you know, did they keep those, throw them away? You know, <laughs> <laughs> they're selling them online. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they put they're them on, on eBay. eBay for. <laughs> They're flipping them for crazy amounts. No, I well, thank you for that. Yeah, I so I, I am still doing them. Obviously, now that we're in some unusual quarantine times, they're on pause for a little bit. But I've been doing daily lunch napkins for the girls for about four years now. Um, and they run the gamut uh, from any and all topics. And sometimes they're great daddy moments to be able to connect with them. And there's sometimes it's pop culture references. But um, to answer your question, no, they don't keep them. And that was intentional. The idea really? uh, for them is to be utilitarian as well as have uh, a nice connection point to them as well. So they get to marvel and maybe show them off a little bit to their friends. Uh, and then they throw them away. But oh, you yeah. are taking pictures. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm I am. Really I'm precious about them, yeah. art and I, I can't handle tossing stuff away, but you're better at that than I am, I think, maybe. I've, yeah, I've learned, to, you know, what's the phrase, to be able to kill your darlings kind of thing. Ooh, so it was, ooh, I, can. Um, ooh. <laughs> I learned that in art school. Yeah, it was, it was a hard lesson, but definitely something that, uh, you know, you, you learn to do. So. Well, I'd love to see those collected somehow because that's just an awesome thing you do. Be cool. Yeah, I've, I've toyed with the idea of at some point putting together a little um, book for the girls and, and even, you know, marketing that isn't something that people can use the artwork, not the ones I've done previously, but to have other people uh, embrace those. I've explored the idea of, of turning that into a product for sure. And, and uh, cool. it's a lot of fun either way. Yeah. At least I a love, scrapbook for your daughters. <laughs> I love that idea Absolutely, yeah. for the daughters. Yeah, that would be completely awesome. Yeah, so, for sure. um, for sure. Uh, do you, before I forget, do you have a Instagram you want people to follow to see some of those or? Yeah, absolutely. It's just my name, Ben Rizbeck, B E N R I S B E C K. All right. So I've, uh, yeah. Send me a request and hop cool. along. Cool. Thank you. Well, um, so today we were kicking around a, a kind of a professional topic to discuss while we draw and we were thinking about, uh, motivation and uh, keeping their motivation up to, to do art. And uh, so while we progress with our drawings, um, we're gonna you know, kick around some question and answers related to that. Um, but we're gonna lead off with Travis, giving us a little introduction on uh, what our drawing topic's gonna be today. All righty. Um, today we're gonna, we talked to, to Ben before and, and we decided that we needed to, uh, to draw dwarves and their mounts. Uh, cause that's important. And, uh, so I'm going to, really? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, <laughs> they've got a, short legs. Yeah. <laughs> they need to get around and, uh, to have fun with it. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what our goal is, is to draw dwarves in their mounts and see where it goes. So, so what are you working on Travis? I mean, I'm working uh, on a dwarf <laughs> and his mount. <laughs> <laughs> Smart Alec. What uh, what are you driving? <laughs> what am I driving? So today I am actually working on my my Apple, and I'm using the uh, my Wacom uh, twenty. I want to say it's twenty two U. You know, it's a twenty four UD uh, or HD um, tablet, and uh, I find it to be quite 
extremely responsive. It's it's their, you know, Wacom came out with a tablet that is basically a lot less than um, their regular tablets. It's very affordable. And I mean, their 16 inch you can get for almost 600 bucks. So, you know, whereas before it was just, they yeah. were expensive. So that's what I'm driving today. The program that I'm driving in is uh, Clip Studio Paint, which is my preferred. Don't get me wrong, I am a fan of Procreate. I love its uh, filming capabilities uh, to record what you're working on. But I just find in my natural progression of art and creativity and jumping in between programs that uh, Clip offers me a lot more resources and a better um, symbolic relation with uh, Photoshop than uh, Procreate will. So, so that, um, go ahead. We're drawing dwarves with their mounts. You're working on your Wacom and your Apple and uh, Clip Studio. So while you're working, here's the first question for you guys. Um, you know, what is it about artistic motivation? Um, do you always feel motivated? Or do you need a kick in the butt sometimes? How does it work? I, to be honest, I think that um, a kick in the butt is needed at times. But, you know, for me, because I do it daily and it, I like eating, you know, food is a, an important motivation to draw. Wait, <laughs> hey, you get paid for your art? A little bit. <laughs> How about you, Ben? <laughs> uh, a little bit, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I find that that there is a, a need for, you know, there. Well, I think there's two kinds of motivation. You know, you have client motivation, which is really easy. You know, they wave something in front of you, and you get excited, and you go, "Okay, I want to." You know, I'm going to go draw that because I'm going to get paid for it. But then you have to create personal motivation for your own IP or your own project, you know, and that sometimes can be a little bit tougher for me when I, and I realize that it's, it's like, I need to draw life of the party or I need to draw, um, I want to draw a bean or something of that nature. I've really sometimes have got to sit down and, and make time to draw for me and motivate me to do it. And sometimes that gets hard, you know, um, but you know, it, it's a, it's like a two edged sword for me on, on, trying to find that that ability to just constantly create. How about you, Ben? What do you feel about motivation? Yeah, I mean, I would I would echo and agree with everything Travis said. I think a lot of it for me is uh, a question of routine um, and timing. And so, you know, with the, obviously we're all parents here and I think that situation has, it complicates some of those, you know, there's a finite amount of time in the day for us to do certain things. And for me, even uh, occupations have, have shifted for me to be able to spend more time with my girls uh, and enjoying that. And I've, I've tried to bring them into that fold and that helps me be more motivated. They get to experience this with me. Although um, my art, many, I think for many artists is a very personal, intimate, introverted sort of thing. And so if I'm really in that space, I, I may be um, neglecting something else or just not listening to something else. So for me, I have warring motivations that happen there. Uh, so I've sort of tried to figure out uh, timing that makes that work a little bit more for me, um, whether it's, and I usually find it's either very early in the morning or very late at night. Uh, and admittedly, the early mornings, even though I'm not a morning person, the early morning motivation is more helpful for me because I'm fresher I might have woken up from a really cool dream that I, I bring into my artwork um, as well too. And I'm not exhausted, but I, again, with same with Travis, it's, it's a daily thing. It's a daily struggle um, to put pen to paper, so to speak for what I'm looking for, but it's definitely cathartic when I do. And I feel better after the fact too. It's almost like going to the gym. Like nobody wants to go to the gym, but after you go to the gym, <laughs> you walk away going, Oh, huh, that was, that was beneficial. No, I walk away going, man, that hurt. <laughs> well, and I agree with you. I, I think that, uh, you know, morning is amazing. I think that's when I do a lot of my own stuff is in the morning. And then I save my client work for the afternoon or mid-afternoon. Because I find that the best inspiration for me 
um, and motivation is early in the morning. Yeah, you know, I've tried so many different ways. When I was a lot younger, I could just stay up late and get my stuff done. And uh, more recently, it seems like if I don't do my personal artwork first, then I end up talking myself out of it or I'm too exhausted to do it by the time the day job and everything else is done. So I, I really agree that trying to get up early and do it is, is the best for me. At least, at least I know I can check that off my list and I feel good the rest of the day. Um, One other thing I would, can I real quick just throw in there yeah, too certainly. from a motivational sure. perspective is that, and this blends into inspiration, I think to some extent, but I, I would put it under the category of motivation is the idea uh, of artists like yourselves. And I'm sure all of our social media is loaded with people who uh, I, and I use the term prolific for a handful of folks. Um, now everyone's circumstances are different, but seeing other people create regularly um, can be a demotivator at times. Like, Oh my gosh, they're artwork. But it's also, I think. Oh, we just lost you. And I think it's also a powerful motivator. Is that what you were going to go for, Ben? You could probably nod. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, while Ben's getting logged back in here, um, I agree with that, actually. It, it does kind of demotivate me a little bit. When you go out there and you see all this fantastic art and you start thinking, geez, what am I doing? Um, it does play on the self-confidence a little bit. Right. Well, but I think it works both ways too, because there's some times I'll go look at something and I might not know who that artist is and I will find uh, a designer or uh, I'll see a picture and I'll go, that is such a cool concept or idea. Um, where did they come up with it? You know, and it kind of motivates me to, to, to look even further into my own body of work and go, how do I emulate that? And I use the word emulate instead of copy. Right. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and pause real quick and see right. if we can catch Ben back in. Ben has returned. So <laughs> what happened, man? <laughs> I, it's the delight. I was literally mid sentence and I just heard the phone drop. Uh, well, there we go. <laughs> well, do you want to finish your thought? You were talking about um, social media being kind of a inspiration and a demotivation maybe? Yes, absolutely. So these, it, it's prolific to see some of these folks, what they're doing, and it helps me get to a place where I feel like um, either it could be a demotivator going, man, they're just cranking out so much good stuff, or I can go, wow, look at them. They're able to do this as well. Um, I should absolutely get to a place where I should uh, you know, push myself even further as well too. So. Well, let's pull up your um, screen and take a look and see what, okay. you're, what you get yeah. to do. I will start here. Let's see if I don't crash out the system. I apologize in advance. If uh, That's okay. We'll just put Patrick on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there he is, Patrick. I'm always here. All right. So it's mirroring my screen. Can you actually share it with me? Or can you pass the ball to me, so to speak? Or do I have okay, to take so it from you? you? Just share the screen. That's share all you got to do. It'll, it'll, it'll uh, project it. And it's not letting me do this now either. Oh. I am the weak link, apparently. Hey, all you are the good here. link. <laughs> well, tell you what, I'm going to pop in then. Yeah, well, I'll Patrick pop in. And yes, then... please. And then we'll see uh, if we can figure out uh, how to get your screen on there. See, and this um, is part of motivation, Patrick, because you still got to keep sometimes moving, even when you have technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, there we go. All righty. So it looks like you got a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> what would be cool for a dwarf to ride, and I thought a dinosaur. So, um. He's, he's doing his battle cry, um, and uh, he's trying to, to wave his big hammer. Um, I explained in our last one that when I draw, I like to, to kind of build a rough sketch, and I just slowly kind of develop it as I find my place and figure out my proportions and 
the way the picture is working. So I don't know if you can tell what's going on, but I can see it. Yeah, he's there. Um, it's going to slowly evolve. Um, how about this for a new question for you guys? Um, what is your artistic routine? We talked a little bit about early mornings. Are there any other uh, tips or advice you'd give for keeping up a regular routine? Well, I think as a freelancer, you have to create a routine. Otherwise, you're not going to be a good freelancer. Uh, and it's figuring out where that balance is. When you have a family at home, which all three of us do, and you have other responsibilities, you still have to work. So you've got to create some sort of schedule that's functional and, and treat it like a job. And I think that's when you're able to, to produce work and, and get stuff accomplished. And it can get kind of tough because I, I know that there are moments where it's easy for someone to go, oh, you're home, you've got time. And they don't realize that, well, I am home, but I'm working. And so I, I think that having that routine is, is absolutely crucial and that other people understand what your routine is. For me to keep the routine by myself is quite easy, but having other people learning to keep that routine with me, uh, I think is the trial. Yeah, I can relate to that. What about you, Ben? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely the case as well. Um, for me, shifting digitally, um, and by the way, whenever you're ready, I think I figured out okay. how to mirror this for you. So let's try. Um, okay. Let's see if I can pull this off. Stop sharing mine and pass the baton. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, so the idea here. And it slowly is kicking over. Can you uh, see this? Yeah, I can see some of it. We see the screen, screen mirroring. <laughs> and it's taking a while. I am. And so you got the, the fan of... of the screen of death. <laughs> <sighs> it's showing me Procreate, and then it went away. Um, so I'll talk about this idea that when we talk about. Um, the routine for for uh, being motivated, I think shifting digitally uh, went a long way for me um, in the sense that I was able to throw away a lot of my pieces that I didn't care for. Um, when you say throw away, what do you mean? Do you mean you actually toss so, them? Well, in many ways, yes. So I, for years, I used to have sketchbooks full um, and I'm going to stop sharing here for the moment. This is, I apologize, fellas, but um, see if this will work again here for me. Oh, there we go. All right, we're in. No, there we go. Yeah, let's oh see some. Gosh. Let's see some artwork, man. Come on, Holy bring cow. it on. We're going to leave it. We're going <laughs> to leave it here for a while while you get I know. going. Okay, so, so I'll doodle here. So the notion uh, for um, is again being able to throw away some items that I don't. Uh, feel work for me. So as a, um, with paper and pencil, I used to just fill sketchbooks with garbage in many ways um, that would ultimately, I'd end up with like a couple of drawings that I really enjoyed along the way. Um, and that was just a real waste of resources in many senses. Uh, and also just an ultimately frustrated and kind of go back and look at and, you know, if I were to, to wanted to re um, tweak anything, as well too. So um, going digitally, it took me a long time to really go fully digital in many ways. Now I still will pick up a, a pencil and, and paper, um, but this is something that allows me to do more with it uh, and explore new ideas um, in ways that I wouldn't necessarily do otherwise because I'm hindered by the medium itself too. Um, so in this, it's chugging a little bit here, but hopefully you guys can see as I go along. Oh, this here. Yeah, we can see it just fine. So okay. it's interesting. Is there, is there something important to you about kind of, um, I don't know, uh, 
moving on and leaving behind old stuff because I, I personally, I think I get kind of precious about things I've created and I have a, I don't know if it's a weakness, but I definitely fall in love with things that I've made and I don't want to lose them. And maybe it's that collector mentality in me, but uh, is it important to you to be able to like let it go and move on? It never, it, I was in that same boat for a long time where I thought, Oh man, this, I'm, I'm hooked on an idea or a thing and I would spend, you know, forever trying to make something really work uh, in a way that it ultimately didn't. And I, I finally got to a place here. Someone would tell me or I would see it and go, yeah, I need to let this go. Like, this is not, not working. <laughs> time to um, move on. And time to move on, right? And so um, I've learned to sort of shortcut that process. Uh, and that's where this sort of iteration comes into play um, for me where I see myself going, yeah, this is, I can recognize mistakes earlier than I would in the past. Uh, and if I do get myself to a place where I go, okay. And I've, I think we've all been here too, where I've lost something where it was something so precious to me, but then the system crashed on me or I've you know, forgot to save uh, like I should have for so long. Um, and by doing that, I forced myself to start over and inevitably I'd end up with a, a maybe a better experience or a better piece of artwork than I had the first time around. Um, so that has helped me to abandon things, knowing that I might rework them in a way ultimately that looks better um, than I had initially too, and, and do it in quicker succession. So I, I, sort of do you a, think that comes from confidence that you know you could do it again? Well, no. I'm yes and no. There's times where I I never quite capture the magic in the bottle, <laughs> the way at least it was, but it's different, uh, and it in many ways looks better or just different, and I'm I'm okay with that. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, it'll it'll suffice for what I need it to be. If that makes sense. I notice that you like to work in layers. Yeah, I, um, and I, I picked this up over, so when we were talking about this, so this is Procreate uh, on the iPad Pro, and this is my Photoshop background over years and years and years, um, layers were my friend. And so seeing a program that allowed me to do that was a big deal. Um, for Procreate, and I've seen other folks, again, when they go fully digital, and I, I saw you do this, Travis, a little bit, where I can be sloppier initially and then I can kind of come back and, and refine what I'm looking for um, after the fact, too. Now, the challenge is if I go like this and take away this, this feels a little chunkier than I'd want it to be. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, I, I find a still trying to discover how I get to a place where the final line works. And I'm doing this faster than I would maybe normally do. Um, I like it. Yeah, I, I, I think that like with for me, when I'm looking at it, working in Clip Studio uh, and even when I work in Procreate, when I'm doing my initial sketch, I'm treating it like I would a, a pencil sketch. It, it's quick and it's loose uh, because when I inked, I, I inked old school. I used to ink on, on vellum, so I would never ink directly on my pe uh, pencils. I would always ink on something else. And so I, I take that same concept into my own workload, whereas uh, when I, what we're seeing when I was putting my dwarf together was just how I would approach pencils. And then I would take that layer and, and put it to about 30%, put another layer on top of it, and then I start inking and hunting down fine, refined details. So very much the same way, just a different, uh, quicker perspective. It's also why I draw in brown. Uh, probably hmm. the reason why uh, Patrick draws in blue. I used to draw blue. I'm just a blue kind of guy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny how some of those those older, you know, like the non-photo blue and some of those things don't really apply, so to speak, any longer, but they're vestigial in ways. But, the, yeah, um, they still persist. Well, yeah. I th I, they have a definitely a place because I can find, like, if I'm going to work in the foreground and I want to add foreground, the nice thing about digital is I'll pick a whole different color, like a green or blue. And now all of a sudden I have my foreground and my background separate visually so I can see it visually. Then when I ink, it's all going to be the same color anyways. And I've seen that in your work too. And I, I had not thought to do that. Usually 
um, I, I wrestle with, maybe not wrestle, but I, I, the way I differentiate is through either just objects or line weights too. But I, I've, I've seen that. I, I think one was a commission you had done recently that had uh, a, some, a number of figures in the foreground. There's that castle scene in the background and you had like the foreground folks um, fairly bright. Did this just disconnect on me again? Um, oh, a little bit. Oh, it did drop out. I do like the mountain scene that you're working on right now. You got to. Yeah, that's it, gorgeous. <laughs> you're fast. <laughs> Ta-da! And there we go. Well, you want to. Uh, oh, here we go. The... We're back in. We're oh, back, back in. in. Okay. We're back in. Oh, it's all oh, good. See, go. there's the dwarf. Let's see a little more of this guy. Um, so. <clears throat> In terms of being willing to change styles, you know, I know for myself, um, I kind of get into a, a routine. I wouldn't call it a rut, but I get into my, you know, my favorite way of doing something. And uh, it's funny, I resisted using digital for a while just because, you know, learning something new. And then every time there's a new piece of software or a new device, then you got to kind of learn something new. For the longest time, I resisted working on an iPad because I was so used to using a tablet in Photoshop. Um, so how do you guys get over that technical challenge of having to learn, you know, teach an old dog new tricks, right? When I got 30% faster because of digital, I realized that I needed to keep moving in that direction. You know, there's, there's something to say when you screw up and you can use control Z or, <laughs> yeah. you know, and go back and rework something, you know, there, there's a, people I think have a mistaken view of what digital art is. And hopefully by seeing this, they'll start to realize we're still drawing. We're still using the same techniques that we would have used before. If we were just drawing on paper, we're just using a different style of quote paper. Right. The process is still very similar. Exactly. Yeah. And for the longest time, I, I've been a huge proponent of tablets. And I, I remember, you know, rewind the clock ooh, a, a decade or more when they were starting to really come out with tablets. I'm like, okay, here it is. Here it is. And it was just never quite there. Uh, and so, you know, getting an iPad, I've, I've had a number of iterations of iPads with the hopes that it would get to a place where I could actually really uh, do what I'm doing now with it. And it just never was where I wanted it to be. Um, and it wasn't until this recently when I started to look and go, okay, so what can this do what I want it to do? And I started watching a lot of those folks on social media that I follow and seeing that little, you know, Apple pencil showing up and starting to recognizing the interfaces. I realized really quickly, like, holy cow, these people are creating world-class artwork with a tablet and I mean again Photoshop and things have, have been I learned that in college 20 years ago so it was I knew digital <laughs> could could get what I wanted to get to but in a method that I'm using now I was really hesitant um, to, to dive into that platform I mean I had been I learned on Macs and I know you both are running on, on Macs but I was I learned on Apple in college but then my career in the game industry all game dev systems, at least that point, were all PCs because we had, uh, you know, the, the dev kits for the Xbox and things were all PCs. So everything we did had to be PC based. And then working with, with Microsoft, they wanted you to be in their ecosystem as well. So I've been really hesitant to get into Apple. Um, and, but it's, it's been really a fun experience and allowed me to, again, do more um, quicker for sure. Well, that, I, I will admit this, that iPad Pro, once I picked that up, and I picked it up last, I think last April, March or April is when I grabbed it. It changed, it changed my whole business mode of, of thought with art because I could now, I had a couple of flights that I had to take that I was traveling for over 10 hours, and I didn't even have to charge the the iPad and I was working at capacity almost better than I was on my desktop. Yeah. So the whole game changed. Yeah. The versatility, the, the weight of the, the, weight. the, the thing, you know? Yeah. It makes a difference, doesn't it? Oh, a complete difference. See, I like where you're going and how you're using the layers, I think, which is good for people to see. 
to to capture different aspects of your your work and then you're i think you're a lot like patrick where you got you kind of build each layer up and each layer becomes a little bit more refined absolutely yeah I, and i've again i stole that off of watching people use procreate to see because usually i would not do this uh and when I used to play in Photoshop, I would really just struggle with getting the drawing to what I wanted to get to it. And you can have your multiply layer and then you start coloring underneath and, and Bob's your uncle. But for this, it, it getting to a place where I can um, slowly dial it in has been helpful. Also, I am way more rigid than I'd like to be. I, I think, you know, and that's the, I think the nature of drawing. We get real stiff real quick. Uh, and so finding, allowing myself to be really loose and, maybe not really loose, but somewhat loose and a little sloppier along the way um, helps keep some of that energy. And I try, try not to lose that same energy as I dial it in, um, even though inevitably it can go away. So I've always had a struggle with that myself, just trying to make spontaneous lines, but then also to be deliberate and make sure that I put them in the right place. But whenever I do that, they do get more rigid and it's not quite as, as loose. Do you have any tips for, do you guys have any tips for like loosening up like that? Well, Just... I'm, I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> I'm very. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Your lines well, are very confident and loose. Well, I'm very loose with my, my style. Cause like, you know, we talk about the sketch for me, the sketch is how quickly can I get everything out? And then I find sometimes where my struggle would be is how do I make it technically strong how do i build it up so uh, this might be a good spot to to jump into uh, patrick and check out patrick and see what he's at all right so while ben's jumping in so ben can keep drawing yep and we'll go to patrick and, and see so you know the cool thing about this is you get to see three different uh, approaches to to artwork and and i really like that hey that's looking a, you can see that it looks like nice. a dragon and a dwarf a dinosaur a dinosaur a T-Rex there, yeah. T-Rex with little arms. Sorry, he's, he's a baby T-Rex. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I ran into a little corner here because, or a little problem because I'm trying to. I, I have this in my mind that he's his legs are kicked out like he's you know woo, and uh, it's right in the area where his where the T-Rex's <laughs> arms would be. So I'm just trying to figure this out. Maybe a quick grid on it. <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, he. I don't want him to be just like a little angry garden gnome, but uh, I don't he's know. He's not a gnome. He's a dwarf. I know. <laughs> but. Uh, so what layer are you on right now? Because are you on your second layer now? Um, three. You're on your third layer. So explain your process. You you go through the process of how many times is it, you know, how many layers before you start feeling comfortable with where your direction is? Um, so I like to do, and this is kind of me OCD. I didn't do it here, but um, I, I label my layers and I'll put like rough layer and then I'll do another layer and I'll call it my sketch layer. And then I'll do another layer and I'll call it my drawing layer. <laughs> and then I'll do my inking layer. You know, it's, it can get out of hand. But um, it's just, I've been a graphic designer for so many years. I just am used to the file process of keeping everything super organized. So I do that just religiously. But uh, I probably get up to, you know, five or six in the drawing layers until I get it to where I want it. And then at some point I might uh, flatten it and then, you know, redo something or clip and cut something out as I'm going along. Um, one thing I have changed recently, which I do like with my current process is um, I used to force myself to actually do a black ink. And I really started to just ask myself, why am I bothering that when I can just make darker pencils and just use my pencils? So um, I tend to do that now. And then that blends better with my painting later on when I do the color. Very, very cool. So I want to, can I ask a question a little, obviously, sure. maybe not off topic, but I know, so Travis, you had a, like a bull or a steer 
Um, and obviously with the, the TRX, maybe I, I missed this as we were no, 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 no. struggling with technology. So is there, is there a backstory? So for me, coming from a character design perspective, I spent a lot of time in my head thinking, okay, what's the narrative behind the guy that I'm creating and, and the like too. So I don't know if you've, maybe I'm, I'm the only one, but I'm curious to know if there's any thoughts behind that. Actually, I was thinking I was thinking more of the story of what the mount story was than I was the dwarf. My dwarf is pretty standard, but then I'm looking at this <laughs> mount going, wow, I just gave him two peg legs in the front. So I'm really more <laughs> curious about what's going on with his story. Um, and, you know, and, and when I'm drawing someone else's character, it's it's hard for me to kind of get into their character. You know, I enjoy it. I it, it, Give me more information. It makes it easy to do. But then when I'm drawing mine, yeah, I get very much into the, the nitty gritty of, of, okay, is this, a, a, is he a devoted dwarf or is he a, a warrior dwarf or, or is he a mining dwarf? I mean, where did he come from? How did he get his backstory? Who is he? And I agree. I think that helps as I'm building characters um, or building uh, design work for a game or something that all of a sudden I've got a better, strong vision in my head of, of what this creature or is supposed to be. So then as I'm designing, I can add elements to it, which if I just draw straight, I can't add those extra elements because I, I don't know what they are. So there's always a reason. Why does he have the pouch? Why is he wearing uh, chain mail? What does the symbol on his arm mean? So it, it's, for me, that's, I'm, I'm a storyteller all the way. Absolutely. But, what what about you, you, Pat, you always have to do background? No, oh, you don't God, have to do <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I do like I've um, and it, it's a, the game thing. I hate to feel like I'm parroting Travis, but absolutely that informs a lot of uh, of what I'm doing. So I don't know if you saw in my dwarf, he's got his eyes uh, are bandaged to so this idea, um, you know, that there's some um, visual atrophy that's happened if he's you know been tucked away in a dark place for too long. Even though dwarves can typically have dark vision, and you know, why is he blind and what is it how does that impact how he experiences the world um you know the same with his armor if it's raggedy what's that say about him was he a general at some point and now has been banished um you know even the, the choice of mount too for me okay so he's this sort of mountain goat which you know lends me down a rabbit hole reference seeking which can be some really cool stuff like horn designs and those patterns and things too so it's a lot of fun and the same way, the storytelling component, I'm just understanding. I mean, I used to draw G.I. Joe characters, my own G.I. Joe characters way back in the day um, in a, such a way that would allow it to, to have a little more creativity to it, too. So it helps me in the process. With the character card and everything, like the... The, uh... <laughs> the flames behind him and the <laughs> stats. Yeah, I, so I, got awesome. pretty, <laughs> I got pretty in-depth with, uh, with my creations. <laughs> Here you go, Travis. I'm going to pass the ball to you. Oh, scary. All right, let me jump in. All right, you got it? Yeah. All right, so yeah. You... <laughs> Peg legs for sure. Well, you know, I just <laughs> – uh, so when I'm looking at stuff, I think having those little extra elements adds a level of, of – diversity and and such into your character or your creature or whatever and and if you look at life itself you know life is not always every serious character actually has some sort of little uh you know quirk about them which makes them even more interesting i think when you take away the quirk they they're no longer satisfying as a character it's like okay cool i can see it you know the one thing i really loved about uh I'm going to reference Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> is if you take the character of Jack Burton, he is really um, the sidekick. While his, while the other guy, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, is the it Egg Shen? No, Egg Shen was the his buddy that. That, uh, oh, the younger guy. The, the younger, younger guy oh, that's yeah, yeah. always right. doing it. He's the hero. Good point. And, and so you, you look at the, <clears throat> the diversity of the character. You know, you've got this, this character with lots of flaws, 
but he's such a great character to look at and enjoy and appreciate because he seems real. People can relate to it. And I kind of think of the same way when we're drawing our own characters. And as I go through that same approach, that I want the character to have flaws. I want them to, to kind of be unique and not a cookie cutter, uh, a typical dwarf, which this guy kind of is a, a cookie cutter dwarf but his mount sure isn't. So I think his personality would be the fact that he, he's not going to give up on his uh, peg leg. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that says more about a character sometimes is what's his belongings are. You know, why did he collect this? Why does he have this? Um, why is it important to him? You know, even if you look at Willow, I think one of the great uh, character designs that they had with Willow uh, and most people don't realize was the strand of hair that his wife cut that he carries throughout the entire movie. It's something so small and yet it has so much significance to the role that he's going to play uh, in the story. Yeah. yeah. Well, Absolutely. all those little things add, you know, realism, right? Those little details, those little story elements. That's definitely well, fascinating when creating stuff, right? I think you touched on something too, that not only the belongings, but it's the reasoning behind it. So the empathy that would stop a dwarf from putting down an animal like this, uh, you know, <laughs> says, says something uh, pretty powerful for sure. Or in the same with the, the lock of hair that that undying love and, and his family connection, he's risking all, you know, for, for their safety says a lot about his character for sure. Well, you know, that, leads me to another question you know what is it that you know I wonder about this sometimes what is it that makes us care about a character because you know there are times when it works and you're totally into a story there's another time when when it doesn't work and I and I wonder sometimes what it is uh is it the the design of the character the story you know how does it all work I've I've seen some some research done on this and i think it's um the notion of the everyman so to speak that as much as you can remove so films and art that the main character you're almost able to project yourself onto in many ways draws a stronger connection to the viewer so the relatability yeah relatability or just that you're not being tripped up now there is there is something to be said about watching someone so foreign from you uh in in their the way that they're handling situations or their character that there's also an escapist component to it as well so you know while i think john wick is almost a a great character of this where he's sort of both but he's just this like Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's there's not a whole lot of john wick there um (laughs) but what what does show up very sympathetic (laughs) yeah but when he does show now you know the puppy dog right but when you get john wick doing what he does you know that's so foreign to nearly everyone in the world that we kind of go oh wow that's that's pretty amazing too so i think there's two sides to it um Hmm. at least in my perspective now you were asking about the colors you can see this is why i'm using the blue in the foreground so i can i can see the difference visually of how i want to approach this when i go into ink Very cool. I like how that's framing the piece. Um, seems like a nice natural vignette to create those uh, foreground elements like that. It's like we've we've come through the forest and we've uh, captured a glimpse of something we didn't expect to see. Yeah, I'm kind of bummed you what? can't see with the tools I'm using. It uh, it gives a sense of foreboding though too, almost as if. You know, you're a goblin looking, you know, this, this sort of cinematic shot of like you're, you're observing a group that neither of them seem to be looking at the camera, right? Or maybe they are, but the dwarf seems to be looking off camera and maybe the, uh, the animal is looking off the other direction as well, too. So you're sort of observing them before they observe. So do you want to jump back into Ben? You think you yeah. got it? Should we give it a try again? Ooh, let's see. Let's see. All right. It's always All right. a... Technology. Woo. Hey, only the best on this show, right? 
<laughs> right. No That's problem. why we asked Ben first. <laughs> <laughs> it's all downhill from here, gentlemen. I... <laughs> No, we're just trying to give you the argument that you need a better computer. <laughs> I this is a this is literally like a two week old laptop, um, <laughs> and yet Apple and PC do not seem to want to play well together. Yeah, um, there's no surprise there. <laughs> let me try again here. It's it says it's mirroring, but it's not giving you okay. what I want it to be giving you. So, in looking at you know, as you're designing, Ben, what do you find to be, um, how do you break away from the standard pose? Because everybody's got the standard pose, you know, they draw them in that heroic deal. Um, what would be the importance of being able to draw other poses besides the, the heroic um, character pose? The, uh, and I'm working to connect here as I talk. So, so absolutely, I think, and I struggle with that. I think that, um, again, I got into the, um, there we go. Um, I got into, from a character design perspective, the, it's the goal, really. What are you trying to do? So with character design, you know, the ultimate goal is to really just draw a character that you would hand off to a, a 3D modeler and then ultimately an animator, et cetera, too. And so you want to be able to have a three-quarter pose that would make, sense that you see what all they're carrying and, and I get trapped by that because I want to show you all the cool stuff that they're wearing right or they have on them and so that it's easy to get into a, a, that heroic pose as I go um, but to answer your question why would I break away from that um, and that's why I said the goal if I'm um, doing an illustration so I, I know a lot of your work Travis is, is very illustrative in that fashion um, that you absolutely you want to show this. And so I had, I had done some scribbles beforehand where I had um, the, well, let me turn these off and I'll just draw this real quick. Uh, I had the, the dwarf sort of hunkered down um, and feeling the ground, you know, to, to see what was going on. Um, you know, so his knees were sort of kneeling down along the way. Um, to read the signs if he, if he was tracking something along the way, right? So, you know, that would be a, a pose. And it's this is a hard pose to do because you've got the form doubled over. So you're, how do you get that bend to read correctly? Um, and I forego then showing you cool stuff, right? So you, you won't see what's on his belt maybe, or you won't see the, the knives that he has. Um, but it's, it's a way for you to really um, see more of the, the story than you would otherwise. You know, that's a, it's an interesting thought process or thought that you, you pulled up, you know, that innate desire to show everything. And I think even as an illustrator, you have to be careful about that. We want to show them everything, every aspect of where the arm is and the hand and, you know, what they're wearing. And, and it, I think it kind of throws the art off sometimes if you're focused always on trying to show them everything, you know, you got to let their imaginations kind of build a little bit too in that. Yeah. You got to be willing Absolutely. to edit. Right. So. Yeah. And I, I, I think visually too. So, you know, being part of caps for the, the period of time that it was when I, I, um, you know, the comic artist professional society, right. Is that the, the full acronym? Did I get that right? You got something that right. Like something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, ish. Uh, I had the, the, that advantage or the the honor, really, of of showing my work uh, to some of those professionals. And um, you know, William Stout, Bill Stout, had looked at my work, and he made a really good point that stuck with me. Is this idea? He said, you know, great stuff, but there's not a lot of blacks. Like I find, um, it, I find throwing stuff into shadow. I really struggle with doing because for that very reason, it obscures things that I would want to show you. We could do um, a whole so, episode on Bill Stout. <laughs> well, absolutely, absolutely. I know. Absolutely. So that's why, of all people, even, you know, I mean, there's so many amazing artists, but hearing those words from him really resonated with me. But it pushed me to the idea of saying, and this is where, again, coming back into Procreate, um, that I don't, so I use, I don't know if, you, if it's going to show or not, um, oh, and it kicked me <laughs> Hey, that ice sculpture is gorgeous. <laughs> oh. 
You really do okay. travel to some nice places, Ben. <laughs> I'm jealous. I do. It's, <laughs> it's how I uh, how I thrive here. Um, okay. So brushes. The idea that I, if you can see these, I get into. I use inking um, and the technical pen. And this is because it forces me to go. And I know you you both have have talked about using different colors. Um, that I I go straight to black because it's harder for me. Um, because I want to be able to get in there and, and get really messy with this um, sort of thing. And that was actually for Inktober. This allowed me to finally finish Inktober. I've never been able to complete a full month of Inktober until I got uh, into this program um, because I was able to just quickly throw things down and, and be a little more messy along the way. So wow. when you say throw it in, you mean like being able to just – drag and drop the, the color right into a to kind of yeah but the the brushes so growing up with photoshop i sort of lived and breathed the airbrush tool you know oh, there wasn't, I see. there's not a real equivalent that without i mean there's a myriad of custom brushes you can get into that i toyed with but finding something like this inking brush at least i've really loved because i can get really just lay it down really thick, yeah. Okay. Lay it down, yeah, and then chisel back into it. And I do absolutely steal a little bit of, I've seen um, Travis do the, the reverse out, which I'm sure is not his own original technique, but I see a lot of his work where you throw a lot of black and then you reverse back out the, the textures. Well, I think that, that, that really helps, you know, kind of add another element to it. And, and you know, yeah, I, I can remember talking to Bill and uh you know that same I, I look at what he does with inks and i just sit there and and i'm in awe and yeah. and and he does that reverse out uh, a lot of reverse out detail so um definitely you can say there's an influence because of bill there the the coolest <laughs> thing i can remember from him we were talking once and and he was well two awesome things to happen the first thing was he told me that uh his kids can't put down my my uh, children's book about pirates so that was awesome that made my whole day but the other thing was he was looking at one of my pieces and he was looking at the bottles and he said uh he goes i appreciate the fact that all the bottles look different hmm. and i i looked at that and and he said that you know how important it was that uh, when you look at life that nothing is exactly the same and he showed me this piece that he did of new york and it's got all these characters in there. And he goes, I want you to look at the shoes. And all the shoes were different. Wow. And, and I had not even realized that until after he pointed it out. But now that he showed it to me, I'm like, oh, my goodness gracious. It, it has so much more of an impact on me of the individuality of each character now in that piece that he drew. You know, and I think it's the same with, with us when we're working you know, it's really easy to get into that field to draw all the dwarves the same or all the, the, their mounts are the same or everything looks the same. And being able to break away from that to create a little bit more unique diversity of that character or that race or that group really, I think, adds to the ability to tell a story effectively. Well, and I think just that uh, one of those little secrets to, to making something realistic is variety. You know, if if everything is the same, 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 then it's always going to look fake. And I think that's one of the big problems with CGI in general, you know, is it's so perfect. It's so realistic, but it's so, it's what, repeated. you're telling me that's not all real? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it is well, one of the drawbacks of digital, I would say, is that uh, when you can copy paste and just reuse, um, you lose that variety and you need... You need that variety to make something look natural. I like how this is forming up, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. So one other person that came and had a huge influence. I actually have uh, three of his prints on my wall behind me here is um, Bernie Wrightson. Oh, okay. sure. His, in particular, his uh, Frankenstein. Um, I have a hardcover of his. That I got that. I picked it up at a thrift store in college, and it changed my world. Wow. Uh, in particular, those those spreads of the laboratory, to your point, Travis, with the myriad of bottle variety and 
just it's insane that detail that he packed into and it's still one of those highs that I'm chasing artistically of saying how, you know how do I <laughs> find a way to bring that I look at work for sure I look at Will Eisner when you look at like his city stuff oh yeah I'm, I'm not talking the spirit or, or the is it spirit yeah the spirit I mean that was great yeah. but when you get into when he starts doing the the stories about his childhood or New York or you know what all his stuff that has meaning but then you look at the amount of detail and uniqueness that he puts into each piece you just sit there and you just go oh my goodness wow I mean it's amazing and and if more artists could capture that element you know that would I think really put them in a whole different ball game absolutely absolutely who else so have, uh, uh, oh go ahead Ben I was just gonna say if you want to take the ball back or I can keep drawing I don't want to oh you want to check the feed here what I've got going on here yeah we'll check in on yep, you please. as you guys were talking about <clears throat> filling in your darks I was uh I decided to start looking for value and shading in my picture so I've been trying to look for areas to add that silhouette um oh see see now we get a, a little bit oh more neat it. just trying to add a little more to his legs and his arm and um that's something i do love in inked artwork specifically is when somebody does a really deep rich dark um shadow area um you know they're they always throw around names like alex toth or other inkers and artists that could just do those really stark contrasts between black and white. Uh, I love that. Um, and, and I think it's a good basis for building anything, whether you're going to end up painting something or you're going to just end up leaving it a finished pencil or something is, is being able to really predict where those really dark, dark areas are and not ignore them. Kind of polish, have a polished piece, whether it's pencil or, or ink. Yeah. So um, this guy is developing a little bit better. What I didn't show you is I did shrink and adjust and move things around a little bit. That's fine. So um, that's just part of my process too is um, that's, I don't know if you guys have gone back to paper recently and you don't have that ability to <laughs> select, um, <laughs> resize, scale. That really sucks. So. I just tried the other day. I was working on a paper piece and tried to resize with my fingers. Zoom in. <laughs> didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or have you ever just thought to yourself, Command Z? <laughs> yeah, I'd love that too. So you know, I've got a question for you, Patrick. Yeah. All right. So you're drawing a dinosaur. Um, are you going to do feathers or scales? Ooh. <laughs> oh, wow. Um. I guess I'm going scales. Oh, old school. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, know we don't typically draw dinosaurs, so. What were you going to so, say, Ben? I was going to say, what I really love about this is that it, it reads as a dinosaur because of, of the proportions and the small arms. But you've, you've gotten away from um, what you typically, so what's strange is when you look at uh, Jurassic Park or any you know, modern film that has gone so hyper realistic, these animals don't, they don't emote, right? You don't see expressions really aside from motion in these characters. And so I think what's really great about this is you've captured, maybe intentionally or otherwise, a, a menacing, uh, a devious nature to your baby T Rex here. <laughs> like it, it's almost this like evil grin with razor sharp teeth and the furrowed brow, like this dwarf is almost along for the ride and he's, you know, reining in this <laughs> nearly wild beast. I mean, that's my own narrative for your, your illustration, but it's pretty cool. I'll maybe, take it. Maybe that T-Rex is thinking, man, I got lunch later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or he's got a lunch on his back. He's just waiting to yeah. flip him off. Yeah. You know what I just realized is I, I didn't intend to, but um, what are those characters in the dark crystal? Oh, Skeksis? The Skeksis. I feel like I drew a Skeksi head. Hey. <laughs> they were based bit. off dinosaurs, at least in my mind. You know, I mean, that's another creator that really did his own thing that I really love. You know, when you look at... Brian Froud, yeah. 
his work and it's the same it's the same thing and and if you look at it he takes things that you're used to seeing and he enhances them into something that's different and unique and, and such and, and beautiful you know so the the thing with Froud, and, and that was i think uh, and travis we have talked about this when we did long beach that drawing at one point with brian Froud. that was my real major uh fanboy moment was walking up to him at San Diego Comic-Con well before it was big uh, and seeing all his artwork. I didn't realize who he was. Like, I mean, I knew who he was, but I didn't know that was Brian Froud standing in front of me. And I sort of squealed a little bit when I saw his work. But um, <laughs> what, what is really remarkable is that if you look, so I've, I'm looking at a library here. I have a fairy book from him. I have the art of the dark crystal as well. Uh, and his, so his work, his style was not developed just for the dark crystal. I mean, it was, it predates oh, very that. Much so. and, yeah, and Jim Henson allowed it to sort of shape that world. But what's really remarkable is if you um, get your hands on that book or anything related to The Dark Crystal, and obviously the new series, if you've seen it, is the world building behind it, um, that he built all sorts of arcana and symbology and things that really, it wasn't just these two races. Um, you know, it was much more behind it that gave it depth. Um, oh. He made the world a character. He made the world in itself. You know, I also look at, um, if you look at the Hobbit that was done by uh, Rankin Bass. Oh, yeah. And you look at the design elements of that, you know, it's the same thing. You have these, they they took it to a whole nother level. I mean, they influenced a lot of us. Um, I mean, that was my first love of fantasy was watching that. Um, and then I find that if you look at who else, it was, uh, oh, do you remember the, the illustrated literature books way back when from the seventies and, and, and such, they did Frankenstein and they did, they were the classics, the little black and white classics and they were yeah, like comics. treasure Island and stuff. Right. Well, I can't remember the name of the artist that did, uh, he did, uh, the time machine, but that hmm style uh has always he's a filipino artist and just phenomenal um time machine hold on i'm actually looking the book up (laughs) but you know you look at these guys that came before us and what they did with black and white and line work it's amazing to see what they what they were able to do and how they were able to build something and how they were able to create just these these gorgeous um, pieces, um, and uh, oh, that's not the one. So, if I remember his name, but you know, I, I I've had those those same moments. I can remember being at a con and and uh, who was it? Uh, oh, he got to draw. Uh, he drove, uh, his name slipped me now. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. <laughs> what did he, what did he draw? We'll just move on. But <laughs> You're getting old. It don't, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm old man now. Here, I'm going to switch over to you, Trav. Oh, great. Let me get back. Uh, well, who else out there um, inspires you guys? Oh, I for me it, it came um, I, it came up in the the nineties comic scene, right? And so I think most of us, Jim Lee, was probably uh, a big influence along yeah. the way, at least for a long time. Uh, I was doing a lot of his cross hatching and character <laughs> design. Uh, and it's, it's embarrassing to go back and look at some of those pieces. They're, they're literally in my yearbook. They, I, I got artwork into my yearbook that are, are like uh, wildcats ripoffs pieces too. So <laughs> um, yeah. So seeing those, those folks, I think what's really cool again about social media in this day and age is being able to have access to people you would never see i mean it's like in, in the animation industry in particular um 
you know, like Corey Loftus is one and some of these other folks yeah. that work at, at you know, Disney and Pixar and um, DreamWorks and things too, yeah. that um, they have uh, these, these viz dev artists who would walk by you on the street. They're not necessarily legendary, but they are just, again, fonts of, of creativity that really um, inspire me in many ways. So I remember the name finally, Charles Vess. Oh, okay. And Charles Vess walked up to my table one year and picked up a <laughs> bunch of stuff and then walked away. And my, my brother-in-law was working with me. He goes, do you realize who that was? <laughs> I had not, and I'm a huge fan of his work, and I felt so bad that I didn't recognize him. But it's like you said, we don't we recognize the work of the artist. We don't always recognize the artist. You know, hey, wait, I, did he pay for the stuff? Yeah, he, he did. It, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't know if he walked away. No, he paid for it, and I and I've always <laughs> wanted to go back and give him, you know, the rest of the series. But uh, <laughs> but then you know, then you have uh, for me a lot of it was indie creators. Um, and some lesser well-known illustrators. I mean, Michael Golden uh, it was, a, you know, I'm a huge fan of Michael Golden's work and his work on the NAM was phenomenal. You know, he did this cartoony style, but yet with so much realism and depth that it didn't feel like you were reading a, a comic. It, it was just, it was incredible. Um, I liked uh, Richard and Wendy Penny for the breakthrough that they did, black and white comics, you know, ElfQuest, early ElfQuest many, many years ago. So you have a lot of these, these um, just talented, talented artists. But then you have a whole other section of artists that I think inspired a group of people that, that weren't in comics. And these were the RPGs, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons artists. I can remember having the deities and uh, demigods book. And just summing through it and looking at this line work going, I want to do that. You know, I want to draw like these guys. It was just unlike anything I'd ever seen. And it was all fantasy. You know, yeah, we had to hide a little bit from it. We didn't want to show people that <laughs> playing D&D back in the 80s. But at the same time, I mean, there's so much good inspirational stuff out there from these, these creators and the work that they did. Uh, and just their style. It was you know, it, it's a pretty amazing to, to now that I've met several of them, you know, I, I also have come to realize that they're artists just like I am that are just a little bit further down the road, you know, and if you treat them like regular people, they treat you like a regular person, which is really cool. And I think the shows have done that for us, kind of given us a chance to, we have our fanboy moments, but it's nice being on the other side of the table to go, these guys are just like me trying to figure out how to make it work each day. Absolutely. Yeah. He needs a little slobber. Yeah. I think there's definitely a little bit of that <clears throat> starry eyed, you know, hero worship that each of us has probably dealt with on one level where you look at somebody's work and you just are infatuated with it. And when you meet him in person, you have that, <laughs> you know, that fanboy moment, but at the same time, um, you know, they started just like you did somewhere. Um, they had to work their way up and hone their skills. Um, I don't know. There's, there's also a lot of unknown artists out there too that are just as talented, but maybe just didn't get the same opportunity, didn't get the same, um, I don't know, didn't have the same break. Or maybe they didn't create the same break for them. You know, a lot of those indie artists put a lot of hard work to get where they were at. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that well, goes back to motivation. I think that'd be a good, good uh, point to make is that, you know, some people give up. Uh, some well, people. I don't, I don't know if they give up. They just might not know how to, to solve the issue that they might, that might arise. You know, we look at it well, at, um, go ahead, Ben. I was just going to say, I think that the landscape has changed. That was also part of that conversation at CAPS that came up was that they, you know, the, some of these folks who are a generation before us, they only had, absolutely, they still had to struggle to, to be seen and, and, you know, whether they're getting coffee for a long time before finally getting their break to ink a couple pages and, and get in the mix. But they only had, you know, maybe a thousand people to fight against. Uh, in, in the scheme of things 
uh, and they wanted it more than those other thousands. But now you're very much in a global environment where you are really wrestling with an international audience um, and, and international um, competitors, I should say, that are willing to put in the time. And I'm not even just talking about what they're willing to be paid for, but just that you have the globe that you're dealing with. And that still comes back to that passion and that desire. You know, you need to want it even more. Well, um, than Pas that. Pascal Campion has a really great bit of advice, you know, and I've used it quite a bit too. Uh, it's post something every day, whether it's a sketch or whether it's, you know, a finished piece or not, it could be an old piece. The, the reason behind it is you get easily forgotten when you stop using your social media for artistic purposes. People forget who you are. You spend your whole time complaining and, and, and angry at the world or whatever. That's fine. That's your prerogative. But if you're not posting art, people walk away because that's not what they're there for. They're there to see art that you were creating. And I think that to be successful or to be, to be seen is, is that whole mantra of I'm going to post something daily because you never know what art director is flipping through and they go, Oh, I, I want to meet this guy. Or I want, you know, most of my work has come because of that because I posted every single day. I don't know who these people are. Uh, they're game designers, they're creators or whatever. And all of a sudden they found me online in a way that I didn't think they were going to find me. So, you know, that's, that's the first part. The other part I think that's super important to look at, and, and this was given to me years ago, back when it was still paper and you were still pushing, you know, before the internet was, the question was, how bad do you want it? And only you can answer that. To sit there and go, yeah, I want it so bad, this is my job, or this is what I want to do for a living. Well, you know, talk is cheap in this industry. Show me that you want it. And, and that was one of the big motivating kickers in the butt for me was going, how bad do I really want this? And what am I willing to give up to get there? And, you know, my family was not on the table. I, I wasn't willing to give them up. But, you know, how much game time was I playing in the late 90s? How much... You know, how many yeah. times I go to the movies or went out or whatever. And I realized instead of being the dude that um, was watching these things, I wanted to be the guy that was creating them. And Bill Stout told me that you will be more successful as an independent than you will ever be working for somebody else. And I totally agree with that. You know, it's, you figure out ways to make it happen. You learn how to roll with those punches. I mean, even now the landscape's kind of wild and changing a little bit, but it doesn't mean that there's still not going to be a need for design and art. I'm actually busier now than I have ever been. So. Well, um, that kind of leads me to a follow-up question that I've been thinking is a, is a good, um, a good question to ask all of our artist guests. Um, I don't know if you guys ever saw that, that old actor studio show. Oh yeah. With James, James Lipton. Lipton. He always had a series yeah. of questions, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and for me, it's just one question. Um, why, why are you an artist? Uh, I think it's because it's the highest paying salary. I in the world now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Uh, no, I, I've been drawing since I was four. And this is just, it's been, in a, in a, it's cathartic, it's expressive for me. It's, uh, there's just this innate thing. And I, you know, whether, it, and this sort of shows up in cooking or otherwise, I think there's a lot of artists out there um, that manifest in different ways. But this is a way for me at least to, I think I'll always be doing this, whether I'm paid for it or not. Um, my eyesight completely goes. I'll still be scribbling, you know, along the way. So that's that's sort of my response. Just, I couldn't do, not do it. Just born holding a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been part of me. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. I, um, I, it, it's just always followed me. I've always, always wanted to to learn how to do it from my earliest memories. I remember looking at comic books and trying to copy them and figure out how I could do it. And nowadays, one, maybe my answer has changed a little bit. 
you know, one thing that I just, I've heard real quick and then I'm curious to hear more, I didn't mean to cut you off is that I've, I've come across people recently who, um, when they find, and they're usually in their late sixties or so, um, ish that when I, I tell them what I do or, or just even the fact that I draw for fun, uh, many times I hear the story where they go, yeah, I, I gave that up when I was 20 and I wish that I had, um, I just thought there was no place for me to ever do anything with it. And so I stopped and now I look back on those 40 years and wish that I had, uh, and that really struck me going, Oh my gosh, you know, to walk away from something because life you think you should, um, is really tragic. Or someone telling you that you should do something else and that you're never going to go anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and see, that's kind of interesting. It's like you said before that you'd find a way to do this. I kind of feel that way too. And I think what I was going to say about my, my reason for doing art nowadays is because it makes me happy. I like it. (laughs) You know, it, I've tried to think of other motivation. You know, what is my motivation? It's because it makes me happy, you know? And not that that should always be our answer for why we do what we do that, well, it makes me happy, but, um, I like to eat. Arctic, you, you said that too earlier, Ben. <laughs> what did you say? Trent? I said, I like to eat. <laughs> like to eat, do it for work. Yeah. Well, it's rare that, that you get paid well for what you love doing. And, um, you know, I, I always find different ways to enjoy what I do for a living. Like right now I'm a teacher. Um, yeah, but you're in the industry. You're teaching the industry. Well, but the what I was going to say is that, um, you know, I'm passionate about teaching. I love sharing what I do and passing it on to the next generation. But if I wasn't doing this too, I wouldn't be doing that very well either. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I have to have this. This is the fuel for for everything else I do. And if I cut this off, then uh, I won't be fun to be around. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know. We might not hang around with you at all then. (laughs) So so what's your answer, Travis? Why? Um, Like Ben, I've been drawn since I was little. I didn't realize that I could make a career out of it until I was in my mid twenties. And that was 25 years ago. But I think there's a a bit of both in there. Um, I love that it brings stability to me, you know, financially. I'll be perfectly honest. Sometimes we need that as a motivating factor to keep producing our work. But I also love, like for instance, this piece, I didn't realize that by the time I'm done with it, you know, I'm like, I like this piece. I could actually see a story in this piece that I just drew. And that to me sometimes is the, the greatest part of, of art is I was able to pull what was in my head, even though I couldn't see it in the beginning and get it to this. And I'm not even, you know, this is not even inks. This is just rough pencils. And I have an idea now of, uh, you know, I can see the color now, how I would do the color. So for, for me, it's that passion of being able to, to create a story and to just draw it and see it come to life. Um, and I don't think there's any other career that, that allows you to kind of do it this way. I look at, um, you know, I, I hear people all the time like you, Ben, that come up to me and they'll go, I have this great idea for a book that I never wrote. And I'm like, why? why are you waiting? You know, go do it now. I, I never understood it because for me, it was like, well, if I got an idea, I just got to get it out on paper and then the idea is out. You know, whether it sells a million or 10 or five or one or nothing, I still got that idea out and I'm proud that I got the idea out. You know, some of my favorite prints that I've done of my own are the ones that don't sell, <laughs> but I did it. And, and so I think that's, you know, when you, when you look at it, I think there's several factors that, that make me enjoy what I do and what I get to do. Um, and most people realize or don't realize actually that, um, they'll joke, Oh, you're an artist. You get paid well or whatever. Well, reality, no, I didn't get in it for the money. Cause 
you know, that, <laughs> that's not a major aspect of it. It pays, but if you understood how much of the, you have to constantly go out and look, you have to constantly always look for a new gig. You know, when your your contract's up, it's up. So then you got to find another contract. And I think that's the same in the game community for you guys. You'd work on a game once the game was done. And you're all unemployed now. And then you got to go back and find another gig. And hopefully you were remembered well enough and appreciated well enough that someone's going to bring you in on a new gig. Animation's the same way. The, to the kid that goes, I want to work for Disney. And I'm going to be, I'm going to work for Disney my entire life. <laughs> they don't understand the animation company. You'll work for Disney on a show. Hopefully you'll get picked up on another show, but that doesn't mean you're going to be working for Disney. You could end up with Warner Brothers or Nickelodeon. You bounce from studio to studio. You know, co comics is the same way. We bounce all the time. So yep. that, that's kind of for me what it would be. I like it. Well, fellas, you know, we've been on for a while now, you know, technical difficulties uh, set aside, but <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop the share. <laughs> I want to see what Ben did, if he yep. can share it again. So okay, let's see if I can do it. All right, get in there. Are we ready? I'm working. I know you're working. Hey, there's Ben. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Ben started sharing. Oh, see? Ooh, that, look at that. That's pretty cool. I like that guy. And if you had another hour, you'd refine it even more. Yeah. Yeah, this is sloppier than I, I typically get to, but... Uh, it looks great, though. I love it. I like the detail on the saddle, too. I really... Thank you, yeah. I really like the... Uh, you know, he feels cold. Yeah, I really like the, it's like the mountaintop. You feel the, the breeze pushing his, his coat and his, his cloak a lot aside, you know. I like that too. Now, is that a third horn down the middle? Right here? On the, on the, or where on, we look? on your beast. You've got the two horns that, that flip. And then it looks like, is that a third horn? That oh, oh, oh. I see what you're saying. Uh, oh, as this kicks out on the air. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I love the the under under the cape <laughs> pictures. Great too. <laughs> your 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 diversity of abilities just amazes me. <laughs> uh, so the the uh, what this would ultimately no, it's not a horn. It would it was meant to be, and this is where value would probably come into play. Um, if you looked at how horses have they would have that armor that would run uh -huh. down like a cowl oh okay you know? so this is sort of a protective piece um along those lines too that's cool. probably run down its forehead yeah so you, okay so we see that that's very cool man yeah i dig it i like your your little lines too that you use for for wrinkles oh, i like that little detail around his ears like that yeah, yeah. You know, I think that adds very much to it. So, and for me, this is my favorite part here. Real quick, is the stubble on his head. <laughs> See, it's those little things. So, let me ask you a question, Ben. Sure. We have a couple of younger viewers that that like to that have watched and and probably have a question or two. But the question would be, if you were to give someone some advice, what would you give them? Uh, advice More, in what? Just any, in any advice whatsoever? To let's say don't they, do drugs. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. You don't want them to do drugs, but let's say they brought you a sketchbook, you know, okay. fifteen, eleven, twelve, or whatever, and they said they like to draw. What would you tell them? What would you? What would be the most? What would have been the thing that you needed to hear when you were that age that would have helped you? Uh, I, I think we touched on it to one aspect is to, to draw every day. I think that there is, um, and, and draw the world around you and, and not to, um, I'm, ah, it sounds weird. I'm not a fan of still lifes. Like, I mean, there's the, the technical element of like draw this bowl of fruit. Um, but for me, for me, it's, it was the idea of 
of human anatomy. I took a lot now as a younger kid, I'm not going to have access to life drawing classes. So this is again, um, to life drawing classes, but um, finding work that helps you learn those fundamentals, like Andrew Loomis in particular, uh, was yeah, a big one. Book. Yeah, there's there's several of his that I have access to. Um, there, you can find them now. For a while, you could, but just really taking time. Like my daughters are really getting big into uh, manga or manga, however you pronounce it. And I make sure to say, understand what you're drawing, right? So understand form. Like, okay, you draw a character that's a leg. There's two lines that make this leg, but realize that there's more to it than that. So look at it as if we're really here. Um, that's been a, a big benefit to me is to not, I've never been one to look at something and draw it, you know, to reproduce it. Um, so from a technical perspective, that's what I would suggest. But then the other one, again, coming back to what we were talking about before is pull out of your imagination. I mean, kids have, I think, you know, the, the reality or the challenge of, of adulthood is to survive, to be a child, to survive being a child into adulthood. If that makes sense to still not let the world beat that out of you and to keep um, that creativity, that inquisitive nature, that search for things that all children have inherently to keep that and nurture that along the way um, and to feed it when it's young. So finding ways to whatever you're into, find ways to, as long as it's legal, find your ways to get into it uh, and don't care what others say. You know, you talked about hiding D and D you know, as a kid, obviously, you know, some parents back in the eighties really freaked out about D and D, but I'm, I'm, I'm teaching it. Right about the kids at school. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I'm, I'm teaching it to my girls now or Magic the Gathering and, and understanding that there's just a whole world out there of um, things that have gone before you, but putting your own spin on it as well. So finding ways to let your own voice um, not only be heard, but to amplify it is what I would suggest to them. Very cool. Very, very cool. I think that's great advice. Well I done, like, sir. I love I it. I like what you've done. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. We're glad that you were able to come on and join us. So you want to flip over to Patrick and we can see what Patrick finished off. And Absolutely. It's not quite finished, but uh, it is what it is. Here it comes. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I feel like he's really, he's uh, starting to really take shape now. There's something, to, you know, something that happens to me when I draw is there's certain areas that those little happy accidents, you know, that pop up and something's going on with his hair that I like and I can't quite figure out what it is, but there's something about the, I don't know, the point the pointiness of his hair that's that I'm digging. Oh, I found out the name Alex Nino. Oh, okay. Alex Nino. Okay. Oh, his stuff is awesome. I'll have to look him up. The um the hair it feels it uh mildly Wolverine esque, but it also Oh has, yeah. <laughs> it has which is a cool I love Wolverine, so he's easy to go there. But I think it has energy to it too. It helps that motion that he's you know, like there's, they're in for some sort of wild adventure that is just about to kick off. Too. I like his eyes. You look at that crazy look in his eyes. <laughs> well, I've been playing with the fact that I think he's going to be a shirtless dwarf too. So <laughs> I can't tell his beard's in the way. Yeah, I know. So I think that's just, just as a dude, I think I put some tattoos on him or something. That would be I was cool. going to say, I don't, I don't imagine a dwarf with a shirt ever riding a, a T-Rex. So I think the <laughs> shirtless dwarf makes, <laughs> makes sense. The prerequisite, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, I think, I think we have uh, gotten to an end point. Um, this has been a lot of fun. We're going to do it again. Um, but uh, before we take off, Ben, is there anything you want to pitch? Anything you're uh, promoting right now? Not for the moment. I, I appreciate the shout out for Instagram. Um, just really connecting with 
uh, other artists and especially in this time when we're sort of sequestered. So I, I appreciate the shout out, but I'd love to see you all online sometime. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Well, it's been Absolutely. great. So um, we don't really have an official sign off yet. So we'll just. Uh... <laughs> Brought to you by two old guys. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Live long and prosper. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> all right. Live long and prosper, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> okay, bye. All uh... right.